It was one of the most groundbreaking science fiction franchises ever to come out of Great Britain, which has also had the good fortune of continuing on into the 21st century. But this isn't Doctor Who. Instead, we're looking at that other British sci-fi phenomenon which actually predates the good Doctor by 10 years. Yes, this is Quatermass. Quatermass was created in 1953 by Nigel Neal when he worked for BBC Television as a drama staff writer, usually in collaboration with TV producer and director Rudolf Cartier. During this period, the ubiquitous TV was quickly becoming the quintessential must-have consumer item in UK households. So naturally, the creation of new content was high on the agenda for TV networks, which in Britain was the BBC. As fate would have it, science fiction had already premiered on American television in 1949, with Captain Video and his Video Rangers, with follow-up programmes such as Tom Corbett's Space Cadet and Space Patrol, appearing soon after in 1950. Yet all of these were primarily aimed at children, whilst the only content available for adults were the anthology series Tales of Tomorrow and Out There. With American TV shows proving to be a big hit with younger audiences, it made sense for the British to follow along a similar path. As a result, the children's sci-fi series Stranger from Space premiered in 1951 with The Lost Planet appearing on UK TV screens three years later in 1954. Yet with so much focus being on the children's market, the door was left wide open for Neil to fill the void with an episodic adult-based science fiction television drama. Shortly thereafter, on July 1953, the Quatermass experiment appeared on British TV in what was a world first, accompanied by the booming score of Holst's Mars, the bringer of war. Somewhat amusingly, it would have been easy for a first-time viewer to believe the Quatermass in the title actually referred to a secret experiment involving something sinister called a Quater Mass. Yet rather paradoxically, Quatermass actually referred to the titular character, Professor Bernard Quatermass, whose first name was inspired by astronomer Bernard Lavelle, whilst Quatermass was randomly picked by Neil from a London telephone directory because he wanted something that would be both memorable and different. The story for the six-part series involved a rocket ship from the British space programme returning to Earth with two of its three crew members missing, whilst the third was acting in a delusional catatonic state. Unbeknownst to anyone at the time, the surviving astronaut had been infected with an aggressive alien presence and it was up to Quatermass, whose team was responsible for the launching of the rocket and its crew, to prevent the alien from taking over the world. To do this, he had to appeal to the humanity of the three astronauts whose consciousness continued to exist deep within the alien to destroy itself. One of the more fascinating aspects of the story was the question of what happens when science goes wrong, which was rarely a consideration in both the movies and TV shows of the era. As an extension of this philosophy, the series also dwelled on the additional question, what happens when the scientists and experts don't know why it's gone wrong? The series was broadcast live on British TV for six weeks and was noted for not only becoming a must-watch event, supported by outstanding and convincing performances from the cast, but also for leaving audiences with intense anticipation with each passing episode. Sadly though, because it was broadcast live, only the first two episodes are known to survive. One of the possible reasons for this oversight was the lack of proper TV recording processes available to the BBC at the time. 
whilst the other surrounds an unfortunate situation whereby an insect can be seen sitting on the camera lens during the second episode for a substantially long period. Despite this, the Quatermass experiment was not only a massive success, which was certainly aided by every television in Britain only having one station to watch, but it left an indelible legacy in the history of science fiction on TV. Furthermore, the series also featured the first ever monster on BBC television, which was actually portrayed by Neil himself even though it was crudely done due to there being no money for special effects. From a fundamental good versus evil story perspective, the series was able to successfully resonate with audiences because Neil took an element of traditional folklore art and placed it within a modern science fiction setting. In this instance, the alien monster somewhat resembled the Green Man who is a classical human figure made of vegetation. Yet in Neil's story, this visage had been twisted so as to adopt a horrifically evil persona. But what was of greater significance was the introduction of Professor Bernard Quatermass, played with great aplomb by actor Reginald Tate. From the very outset, Quatermass was characterised as a person synonymous with British heroism and high moral standards, particularly as he strived to save humanity from the threat of an aggressive alien force. With the Quatermass experiment being an unprecedented success for the BBC, plans were quickly put in place to create a follow-up sequel with Neil as the writer. As a result, October 1955 saw Quatermass 2 appear on UK TV screens. Following a similar formula to its predecessor, the Earth was once again under the threat from a mysterious alien presence. Yet this time around they had taken control of the minds of senior officials within the British government as part of a conspiratorial plot to alter the atmosphere of the Earth to allow colonisation. Naturally, it was up to Quatermass to prevent the invasion from succeeding at great personal risk to both himself and his colleagues. In what should have been a rather straightforward process of creating a new series then basking in its success, Quatermass too experienced a number of significant highs and lows during production. Chief among these was the sudden recasting required for Bernard Quatermass as Reginald Tate, who was scheduled to reprise the character, tragically passed away a month before production began. As a consequence, actor John Robinson was brought in as a last-minute replacement, despite voicing his concerns about not only attempting to live up to Tate's legacy, but also the difficulties he faced in learning all the necessary technical jargon. Yet on a more positive note, even though Quatermass 2 was once again broadcast live on TV, this time the BBC had learned from their previous mistake by ensuring all the episodes were recorded for prosperity, which are still available for viewing today. Although the sequel was considered compulsive viewing, some criticism was levelled at Robinson's performance not living up to that of Tate which was certainly understandable given the circumstances of his hiring. Yet despite this, the series not only saw a larger increase in audience numbers, but it was also applauded for the relatively new process of intercutting pre-film sequences shot on location into the live on-set broadcast, the result of which not only gave the narrative a far greater sense of depth and sophistication, but also became a common production technique for many years afterwards. Also, continuing Nigel Neal's trend of incorporating folklore traditions into a science fiction horror setting, the story encapsulated the idea of the Devil's Mark, which was used to identify humans under the influence of the aliens, especially when they appeared in a possessed-like state.
As an extension to this, the term zombie was used to describe these people. But without doubt, one of the most significant aspects of the story was the concept of a government conspiracy alongside large, secretive factories manufacturing products which even the local population were completely oblivious to. By contrast, this plot device, which was clearly designed to increase the paranoia within the audience, was not yet a factor in American science fiction films and definitely not in TV shows as the US government was always portrayed as the good guys, protecting their citizens from evil forces. With the highly successful release of Quatermass 2, the 1950s wasn't done with the ever-popular Professor just yet. December 1958 saw Quatermass and the Pit airing on UK television for six weeks. The synopsis this time around involved the discovery of an ancient malformed skull along with an unusual bomb-shaped device at a dig site in London. It is then revealed that the relic was a long-crashed spaceship from Mars and its Martian occupants which were part of a colonisation process initiated five million years ago. Yet after being unearthed, both the psychic and telekinetic powers of the aliens once again attempt to take control of the world, which Quatermass must thwart. After the somewhat lukewarm reception to John Robinson's performance in the previous series, Bernard Quatermass was recast for a third time with Andre Morel taking on the role. As fortune would have it, Morel who was often cast in movies portraying authority figures, brought an indelible presence to the role, which was considered by many to be the character's defining interpretation. From a historical perspective, this latest Quatermass series was made at a time when the space race had commenced with the launch of Sputnik the year prior, which also meant the general public were now far more interested in space exploration. As a consequence, the series was so successful it later spawned parody episodes from Hancock's Half Hour and The Goon Show. Finally, in what could be considered a climactic conclusion to Neil's folklore horror trilogy, not only were the Martians responsible for the formulation of witchcraft, ghosts and poltergeists throughout human history, but it was even noted how the Martian apparitions actually looked like the devil. For all intents and purposes, Quatermass should have been hailed as a highly successful science fiction television trilogy at the conclusion of this series. Not only had it reaffirmed Nigel Neal's status as a prolific TV writer, but the production quality of each story had increased significantly from the relatively crude Quatermass experiment to the much more polished Quatermass in the Pit, made just five years later. Alongside the enhancement in production quality were the special effects, which in the latter two episodes were certainly worthy of praise. Yet this wasn't entirely surprising considering the BBC had since formed a dedicated special effects unit after discovering it didn't exist for the first series. Finally, to round off the success of the Quatermass franchise, were the otherworldly sound effects to represent the aliens, all of which were the product of the newly formed BBC Radiophonic Workshop. But Quatermass didn't end there, and nor did it end on a positive note for Nigel Neal. In the wake of the highly popular Quatermass experiment, broadcast in 1953, the franchise entered a very complicated and difficult period, as plans were quickly put in place to turn the series into a feature film franchise, one which would feature limited involvement by Neil. Before he had even written Quatermass 2, the Hammer Film Company, who would later become famous for producing world-renowned horror films, had already seen great potential in Quatermass, 
so they quickly purchased the film rights to adapt both of Neil's TV stories for cinematic release. With Quatermass now destined to enter the feature film arena, not only did the production have a larger budget and better marketing than its TV counterpart, but the lead actor playing Bernard Quatermass wasn't even British. In an attempt to lure in American audiences, and at the bequest of Hammer's US distributor, American actor Brian Don Levy was recruited to portray Quatermass, who was now part of a joint British-American space programme. But perhaps worst of all, the films were renamed for the American market, with the Quatermass experiment appearing as The Creeping Unknown, a title which Neil vocally detested, while Quatermass 2 was retitled to Enemy from Space. Yet to their credit, Hammer certainly didn't damage the Quatermass brand. If anything, it could be argued they helped give the franchise greater exposure. Despite Don Levy's portrayal of the now American professor being more gruff, demanding and far less likeable compared to the television version, the films were slick, fast-paced productions featuring outstanding sets and wonderful special effects, even if core elements of the story, especially for the first film, differed significantly from the original source material. Furthermore, the films also included a greater sense of tension, drama and far more violence, with key characters being killed on screen and blood being a common sight. Needless to say, Nigel Neal was not at all pleased with these adaptations, mainly due to the necessary script changes required to truncate the story into a much shorter running time, which is particularly evident in the conclusion of the second film, where the sequence involving the destruction of the alien asteroid is vastly inferior to the TV version. Adding insult to injury, was Don Levy's casting which Neil did not support at all, along with not receiving any financial royalties from ticket sales. As a result of this situation, in 1956, Hammer attempted to create an original sequel to the Quatermass experiment. Unsurprisingly, Neil flatly refused to give them permission to use the Quatermass name for the film or title character. Regardless, X the Unknown still continues to be looked upon as an unofficial Quatermass entry. With the 1950s having been saturated with numerous Quatermass products both on the small screen and large, it was rather surprising to note the theatrical adaptation of Quatermass in the Pit didn't appear until 1967 a full 10 years after the cinematic release of Quatermass 2. Once again, the film retained its original title for the UK release, whilst in the US it was renamed to 5 million years to Earth. Despite the long gap between movies, Quatermass and the Pit appeared at an ideal time to revitalise the franchise especially as the screenplay was penned by Neil himself, which in turn made it the most faithful adaptation of all the TV series. In addition, not only did the film appear in glorious colour, but Bernard Quatermass was now portrayed by Scottish actor Andrew Keir, with Brian Don Levy having been replaced at Neil's insistence. Although the film was looked upon as a great success, it wasn't enough for the TV series to be remade using more advanced production techniques. As noted by historians at the time, science fiction on the tube had only been around for a handful of years when the Quatermass journey first commenced. Yet nearly 15 years later, the entire sci-fi landscape on both sized screens had evolved significantly. For this reason, a triumphant return of Quatermass wasn't forthcoming, with the BBC, Hammer and even Neil himself feeling the franchise had run its course and needed to be rested.
after over a decade in hiatus, 1979 saw Quatermass reappear once again on the TV screen in a four-part miniseries made by BBC's rival, ITV. This latest instalment was written by Neil and was simply titled Quatermass, though it was sometimes referred to as Quatermass 4. Shortly thereafter, an edited theatrical version appeared in the cinema called The Quatermass Conclusion. The story for this grand finale revolved around an alternative 20th century, where for some inexplicable reason, urban decay and extreme violence among the youth had engulfed cities around the world and where science was considered evil and not to be trusted. In amongst the chaos was Bernard Quatermass, who discovered the corruption of the youth was all part of a harvesting program initiated by an unseen alien force. For this iteration of the series, John Mills played a somewhat subdued and less imposing version of the title character. Yet what was more unfortunate was that both the series and film failed to gain any traction with audiences and critics, quite possibly due to the depressing notion of Britain effectively being at war with itself. Since then, Returns of Quatermass have been sporadic at best, though a new series did appear over the airwaves for BBC Radio in 1996 called The Quatermass Memoirs, written by Neil, with Andrew Keir once again reprising the role of the fabled professor. As for an on-screen presence, Quatermass reappeared as recently as 2005 with a brand new adaptation of the original 1953 series. Produced as part of a BBC experimental live broadcast TV movie, with the iconic Professor being portrayed by Jason Fleming. Yet as fortune would have it, the exploits of Quatermass weren't just limited to the screen or radio, but also in the much coveted written form. In what could be considered a godsend for Quatermass devotees, Neil had the foresight to release four novels from 1960 through to 1979, based on each of the TV series. Naturally, these literary versions offer far more depth and scope to the story than was possible with what had been seen on screen. Despite having an on-again, off-again history spanning more than 70 years, Quatermass may not be as famous as other British science fiction entities such as Doctor Who, The Thunderbirds or Space 1999, but it still continues to enjoy a massive and highly devoted fan following. So it really doesn't matter if people prefer the TV series, film series, novelizations, or even the radio play. The important thing is the legacy of Quatermass will continue to live on for generations to come, because Quite simply, it's the name of a classic British science fiction hero no one can ever forget. <laughs>